the way Hollywood has portrayed the underworld in talky pictures. By now, America is well launched into an era of amazing madness. Bootlegging has grown from small individual effort to big business embodying huge coalitions and combines. The chase after huge profits is followed closely by their inevitable partners, corruption, violence, and murder. A new and horrible tool appears, the Tommy, a light, deadly, wasp-like machine gun, and murder henceforth is parceled out in wholesale lots. Crime in America, like almost everything else in that remarkable country, tends to be bigger and more spectacular than it is elsewhere. And even in the silent era, the cinema tended to reflect that. But it was the introduction of sound that brought about the coming of age of the crime movie. Now, for the first time, the audience could hear, rather than just imagine, the screech of tyres on wet tarmac, the rat-tat-tat of the machine guns, and the tough, snarling language, apparently much favoured by the denizens of all those mean streets. But just as significantly, talking pictures arrived as the bootleggers reached the full flower of their affluence. And just before, they transmuted themselves into the mafia and other forms of organised crime as we now know it. And since organised crime represents the dark side of the American dream, its participants being no less interested in the pursuit of wealth and power than those engaged in more respectable businesses, films that charted the rise and fall of gangsters were not only dealing with criminals, they were dealing with American society. So the crime movie swiftly became and remained one of the quintessential ingredients of Hollywood production. Indeed, the very first all-talking picture, made fittingly enough by Warner Brothers, who'd started the sound revolution, was a gangster film, The Lights of New York. I planted the stuff in Eddie's shop. Yeah? And the dicks will be there at 10 o'clock. Uh-huh. But they must not find Eddie. What do you want us to do? I want you guys to make him disappear. What, you mean... Take him for a ride. Oh. Public interest in gangsters extended well beyond their film image. On screen and off, these people were stars, as famous as the actors who portrayed them. Well, there was so much of it on the front pages of the newspapers in those days. The Al Capone gang and the Dutch Schultz, and you read about it every day, and it struck the public's fancy. The public were frightened of them, but they were sort of like pirates, and, you know, they're frightened and a bit colorful. And as long as they didn't have to mix with them and they were distant, they enjoyed reading about them and hearing about them and seeing about them. Ernie, you're through. You hire these mugs, they miss. Now you're through. If you ain't out of town by tomorrow morning, you won't never leave it except in a pine box. They were melodramas, and the public responded to them. So Warners, uh, they became known as Murder Incorporated. The curious and ambivalent social status of the gangster was emphasized when Capone himself was rumored to be about to star in a film. He never actually did, but the fact that such a thing could even be mooted indicates that the public appetite for tales of the underworld, fictional or otherwise, continued unabated. Criminality is always interesting, and the special criminality of Capone and Legs Diamond and so on derived from prohibition which was a very unpopular piece of legislation. Prohibition, or the Volstead Act, which became law in 1920, virtually guaranteed the creation of the gangster. During the jazz age of the 20s, people legally denied alcohol naturally insisted on having it and bought it from their friendly neighborhood bootlegger. Even President Harding had a bootlegger by appointment to the White House. But naturally, there was a dark side, and Public Enemy, written by two knowledgeable Chicagoans, John Bright and Quebec Glasman, focused on this, showing the price that had to be paid if the public was to continue enjoying its daily tipple. Come 
company's got to protect your customers. But what am I going to do? I can't help it if I have to buy from Schemer Burns. They tell me the same thing that you do. Ah, uh, you're yellow. Oh, uh, please, you ain't going to slug me, are you? Uh, maybe not today. But I'm telling you this for the last time. When Dutch comes around, he's going to leave you some beer. And you're going to take it. And you're going to kick him with the dough. If you don't, somebody's going to drop by here and kick your teeth out one at a time. Get me? Yeah, and you'll be needing some right away. How many shall we leave? Oh, two, two kegs. You hear that, Dutch? Bring in five kegs. As the depression that gripped America in the 30s grew worse, practically the only people who thrived were the gangsters, and this merely raised them higher in public esteem. To the poor and desperate, especially the newer immigrants at the bottom end of the social scale, what their success demonstrated was that the system could only be beaten by guts, determination, and the trifling matter of a total disregard for the law. I'm giving you orders for the last time. There's only one thing that gets orders and gives orders, and this is it. That's how I got the south side for you, and that's how I'm going to get the north side for you. Some little typewriter, eh? I'm gonna write my name all over this town with it in big letters. Hey, stop him, somebody! Get out of my way, Jenny! I'm gonna spit! Paul Muni was, of course, a thinly disguised Al Capone, and indeed legend has it that Capone vetted and presumably approved the script himself. Scarface included at least 15 killings, thus making it quite the most bloodthirsty gangster picture yet. But in the words of the director, Howard Hawks, these were violent times, and violence made the story. But by now, America itself had grown worried about criminal excesses and the fickle public had turned against the hoodlums in its midst and the possible role the cinema played in fostering them. One of the incidents that had outraged the nation was the admittedly accidental killing of three children during a gang battle on the streets. Scarface even managed to capitalize on that. Did you read what happened the other day? A car full of them chasing another down the street, broad daylight. Three kiddies playing hopscotch on the sidewalk, get lead poured in their little bellies. When I think what goes on in the minds of these lice, I want to vomit. So the gangster, no longer a public benefactor, now became the scapegoat society's problem. The arrest of Al Capone on tax evasion charges, surely the least of his crimes, and the death of such hoodlums as Legs Diamond signaled the beginning of the end for the flamboyant bootlegger. But worse was to come. In 1933, the Volstead Act was repealed, and after 14 years, prohibition was dead. <laughs> Mother of mercy. Is this the end of Rico? Well, temporarily at least, yes, it was. When you think back to the middle 30s, the principal protagonists were gangsters. Their stories were colorful. We all aspired to wealth and grandeur and excitement and beautiful ladies and fast cars and a fast life, because most people at home live from peak to peak to peak. They don't want to get down into the valley. That's what frightens them. If they have to live 24 hours a day, that's just too bad. They don't want that. They'd rather go to a movie for two hours and live a whole lifetime in two hours, where you hit all the peaks. So when the gangsters were beginning to lose favor, detective took over. If these gangsters want to use machine guns, then give your special agents machine guns, shotguns, tear gas, everything else. This is war. Now understand, I don't want to make them a group of quick trigger men, but I do want the underworld to know that when a federal agent draws his gun, he's ready and equipped to shoot to kill with the least possible waste of bullets. He was from the FBI, or he was from the, the government people, the treasury people, he was also a gangster, but now he wore a badge. In the cinema, G-men replaced hoodlums as purveyors of violent, exciting action. Even the moralists liked them. They might be no less vicious than the crooks, but at least they were on the side of law and order. In real life, it wasn't actually the smooth, organized city hoodlum who occupied the attention of the FBI, the G-men, but the rural crook, the likes of Babyface Nelson, Pretty Boy Floyd, Machine Gun Kelly and John Dillinger. For these were an easier, more visible quarry. But in the depressed country communities from which they sprang, they were not seen as criminals, but as latter-day Jesse Jameses. 
I think secretly, a number of us uh, admired Johnny Dillinger and laughed at the things he did. He was a man with a sense of humor. He was, he was a hero in the Midwest, um, where they were, where they were uh, and I hope they take a lesson from it today, where the government was, and the states were seizing farms and foreclosing. But Johnny to them was a defender, and to the public, and in that sense, in that film. There was a nostalgic element in the High Sierra. It was the passing of the individualist in crime. Oh, yes, there's the sheriff over there talking with a man with a queer-looking rifle. Any minute now, it may be curtains for Roy Earl. This seems to be the coldest place in the world tonight, cold and unreal. One is awe-stricken by the gruesomeness of this rendezvous with death. The morbidly curious onlookers standing by as if they watched a game. The tall pine trees clustered around like a silent jury. The stern-faced officers of the law waiting for the kill. And up above a defiant gangster from a simple farm on the flats of Indiana, about to be killed on the side of the highest mountain peak in the United States. Despite their status as semi-folk heroes and their noble tradition of robbing not individuals but banks, the rural desperados could hardly be regarded as social benefactors. And neither, after the repeal of Prohibition, could their urban counterparts, the city bootleggers. Robbed of their popular position as slakers of the public thirst, they were now looked upon simply as criminals, dealers in organised vice and the like. But with the election of President Roosevelt and the introduction of the New Deal, these city mobsters found themselves cast unwittingly as instruments of social welfare. The nation, and by extension the cinema, began to seek the reasons for crime. In films, the gangster was still the scapegoat, but now he was seen as the symptom rather than the cause of what ailed society. Instead of merely depicting the fast life and violent death of the city hoodlum, the movies began to examine the conditions, the poverty, that had bred him in the first place. Your prayers, Muggs. On a level, Miss. Oh, 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 Stop your squealing. Who's the leader? I am. Come here. Collect that dough and fast. Come on, hand it over. Me too. Come on. Yeah. Now get him up and turn around. Hey, what's the matter? Next time you roll a guy for his poke, make sure you don't know your hideout. How'd you know? It brought the American public into contact with a side of life that they didn't want to think about. And suddenly there it was on the screen. And by being on the screen, it became a lesson for them. Oh, Rex. Hey, you ain't. You ain't Rocky Sullivan. They could empathize and sympathize with the characters who were under those conditions. So if a fellow would come into a neighborhood and corrupt some of the kids or the neighborhood itself, it was one thing. But then when they brought you into his mother's house and you saw how he was raised, you realized maybe there was a reason for it. And so the whole basis of guilt and whether you knew that what you were doing was wrong or right went back even to the courts of the time and hundreds, maybe thousands of jurors in real trials mm -hmm. had in their minds a concept of guilt and association with where someone was raised. It doesn't happen in one movie that these lessons are learned necessarily, but over a period of movies and images that we take with us all our lives. That's the power of the movies. So long, kid. Goodbye, Rocky. May God have mercy on you. In Angels with Dirty Faces, he plays a game so that the kids won't become like him. And he begins to cry and uh, beg for his life so they won't think he died a hero. But he's a bigger hero because he did it purposely in order for them not to have the same kind of life. Why don't I die? Oh, please. 
I don't want to die, help me. Oh, don't make me burn that off. Oh, please let go of me. Please, no, kill me. Oh, oh, don't kill me, please. Oh. Having paid his dues as an instrument of social welfare, the crook as protagonist once again left centre stage, and a new kind of hero now appeared in a new kind of film. The scene of the crime, or anyway, the scene of the crime movie, had moved westwards from the high-rise landscapes of the eastern cities to the low-rise tenements and beach houses, roadside restaurants and fancy apartment blocks of San Francisco and Los Angeles as they were conjured up in the novels of Dashiell Hammett or Raymond Chandler. And the stories changed too. The hero was no longer a simple cop or robber, good guy or bad guy, but someone who lived in the shady area in between. A private eye, perhaps, like Sam Spade or Philip Marlowe. Certainly he was someone happily prepared to bend or even break the rules to serve the ends of justice, or what he perceived as justice. After the war, the French critics, who seemed to find difficulty in recognising anything until they've stuck a label on it, called the movies in which such characters appeared film noir. Well, to be fair, it's not a bad name, because the films were dark, not only in their shadowy lighting, but in their content. The moral certainties of pre-war pictures had vanished, and in their place were doubts, suspicions. Nothing was quite what it seemed. The good guys weren't all good, and the bad guys weren't all bad, and this applied even more so to the women. What such films illustrated was the less trusting, more cynical attitude of people who'd lived through a war and were trying to come to terms with an uncertain peace. Who are you, soldier? Marlowe's my name. I'm a private detective. Who's the girl? A client of mine. Geiger tried to throw a loop on us, so we came up here to talk things over. Convenient, the door being open when you didn't have a key, huh? Yeah, wasn't it? By the way, how'd you happen to have one? That any of your business? I could make it my business. I could make your business mine. Well, you wouldn't like it. The pay's too small. All right, I own this house. Geiger's my tenant. Now, what do you think of it? Well, you know some nice people. I take them as they come. Got any good ideas, soldier? One or two. Somebody gunned Geiger, or somebody got gunned by Geiger who ran away. Or he had meat for dinner and likes to do his butchering in the parlor. No, I don't like it either. Maybe you better call your friends downtown. I don't get it. I don't get your game here. Don't you, Mr. Mars? Wondered why you didn't ask me who I was. You seem to be telling me Geiger was in a racket of some kind. Uh-huh. What racket? I wouldn't know. I'm not his landlord. But I'll tell you something you missed. Somebody cleaned out the back of Geiger's store today. You know, you talk too much. You really got those boys outside? Open the door. Open it yourself. I already got a client. The country had... had become more sophisticated. Had... had, um... come out of its... of its western phase, shall we say. And, um... and, um... had a different... appraisal than before. A different view of life, if you will. This, um, this undoubtedly had something to do with the war. They became dramas instead of melodramas. To explain what I mean, the main difference between drama and melodrama is this. If I point a gun at you and I say, I'm going to kill you, and I pull the trigger, and the gun misfires, that's melodrama. But if I point a gun at you, say I'm going to kill you, and I cannot pull the trigger, it becomes drama, because that's to do with my character. That's what was beginning to happen in movies. You, do you know what you want? Yes, and I had hopes once, but I gave them up. Hopes for what? A world in which there's no place for Johnny Rocco. Mm -hmm. Okay, soldier. Here's your chance. Give it. Okay, soldier, you can make your hopes come true. But you gotta die for it. See where I'm aiming? Right at your belly. Go ahead, shoot. Get away, sister. Get away, Nora. Shoot! All right, you got a gun now. 
You want to use it or not? Kill him, Major. Yeah, kill him, Major. <laughs> Go ahead, show him how you're not afraid to die. Shoot! Inspired by the idealism of the war years, movie makers began to make films that more closely reflected everyday life. In the late 40s came a crop of liberal or even left-wing crime pictures that were able to comment on American society in a way that would have been unpalatable in a more straightforward guise. The minute it's a crime picture, you have political freedom to say whatever you please because you are now dealing in a genre where the intellectual content is absorbed into what they think is a dark criminal type of picture anyhow. And so there's acceptance of that. If you did it with a nice, friendly group of Americans sitting at home, they might be upset. But in a crime picture, it's acceptable. You take your chance, Joe, and get out of here. I'm an honest man here, not a gangster with that gangster tucker. Are you telling me, a corporation lawyer, that you're running a legitimate business here? What do you call this? Payoffs for gambling and illegal lottery policy. Violation 974 of the penal code. Policy, the numbers racket. I do my business honest and respectable. Honest, respectable? Don't you take the nickels and dimes and pennies from people who bet just like every other crook, big or little in this racket? They call this racket policy because people bet their nickels on numbers instead of paying their weekly insurance premium. That's why policy. That's what it is and that's what it's called. And Tucker wants to make millions, you want to make thousands, and you, you do it for $35 a week. But it's all the same, all policy. It took a, a fundamental attitude towards the society rather than let's fix it up attitude. It said the society consists of this and this. It doesn't matter which side of the law you're on, it's the same. It's the same structure. The structure is what defeats us and so on like that. By implication, or no one ever says anything like that. And they all thought it meant that too. Ladies and gentlemen, the motion picture you are about to see is called The Naked City. The movement towards greater realism was taken one step further by The Naked City, which left the studio back lot to film on the streets of New York itself. As you see, we're flying over an island, a city, a particular city. And this is a story of a number of people, and a story also of the city itself. The audiences were beginning to ask for, what's it really like? They found that that was as a as exciting and maybe more exciting than the made-up stories that were the gangster periods. They began to say, what do the cops really say? How do they really act? The truth or the near truth or the illusion of truth became exciting and dramatic. It's Garza! It's Garza! Halloran's after him! They're running towards the Brooklyn end! You stay with Halloran! Don't shoot unless you have to! You just stay with him! Get radio! Have to send a car from the Brooklyn end! You both, get in! You do cover this end! By the time The Naked City was in production, no one knew better than its producer and narrator, Mark Hellinger, that organized crime wasn't just something that happened on screen. Hellinger himself, a former New York journalist and Broadway character turned film producer, was well acquainted with at least one eminent mobster. Mark would have all kinds of characters around there having a drink with you, and he'd introduce you, for example, he'd introduce one guy who's there, was this, this Ben, and this is Brooks, and this is... Uh, Albert Maltz and so on. And then the guy would get up finally and leave and he'd say, you know who that guy is? Bugsy Siegel. He doesn't like to be called Bugsy. He wants to be introduced as Ben, that was Ben. He was here to borrow a million dollars. What the hell, he says, I haven't got a million dollars. If I had a million dollars, I would have spent it. And I tried to raise it for him. He'd been here for four hours. I called everybody. I couldn't raise anything. I couldn't even raise it for myself, let alone for him. Now, he needs the money. He says if he doesn't get the money, in a couple of weeks he's not going to be around. 
Well, he didn't get the money, and it was less than a couple of weeks and he wasn't around. Those are the kind of people who are around Mark. In 1951, the nation as a whole began to learn about organized crime when a committee headed by Senator Estes Cafalva investigated its activities and the structure of its organization. In Erickson, will you state any legitimate occupation which you ever participated? I refuse to answer on the grounds of my intent to incriminate me. Perhaps because it was overshadowed by the even more startling activities of Senator Joe McCarthy and his communist witch hunters, the Kafalva Committee failed to inspire any great number of films dealing with organized crime. One picture that did look into the subject, however, was a low-budget independent production called The Enforcer. The only chance for a guy like me is to start a new racket. And I got one. A brand new one. One nobody ever thought of before. I must have kicked you in the head. I've given it a lot of thought, and the business I got needs no investment. You can carry it around in your hat. All you need is a telephone. I don't see no money in a hat and a telephone. What job always pays the highest? The most dangerous one. Yeah. Today, I went into the most dangerous business in the world. What's that? The murder business. The Enforcer was a highly fictionalized account of one of the few mob organizations to come to public attention since the arrest of Al Capone, the notorious hit squad Murder Incorporated, one of whose principal architects was Louis Lepke Buchholter. During the past two years, five former members of this gang have been shot. And now a respectable citizen has been killed by bullets apparently intended for another Lepke associate. Lepke must be found dead or alive. In 1954, a former associate of Lepke's, Albert Anastasia, the so-called Lord High Executioner of Murder Incorporated, also found himself one of the models for a motion picture. One of his corrupt sidelines, well, all his sidelines were corrupt, had been to control sections of the Longshoremen's Union in New York. And it was this side of mob activity that was examined by writer Bud Schulberg, director Elia Kazan, and actor Marlon Brando in On the Waterfront. <laughs> The filmmakers themselves have become closely involved in a movement aiming to kick the mobsters out at a forthcoming election. Our feeling, and we were not only making a movie to please an audience, but also involved in the struggle, as I say, of these men, who we felt were definitely on the side of the angels. And uh, so it was our hope, it was our hope, when I say our, I should say uh, Kazan's hope and my hope, that the film would come out in time to have an impact on the election. All right, let's go to work! The climax of On the Waterfront, dockers throwing out the mob and regaining control of their union, was closer to fantasy than fact. Interestingly, in the novel adapted from his own screenplay, Schulberg had the Brando character being bumped off. I remember this! I remember every one of you! I'll be stopped! Don't you forget that! On the Waterfront was an exception. Generally speaking, in the 1950s, the big American studios kept away from the subject of organized crime. The wounds inflicted by the communist witch hunts of the McCarthy era, which after all had sought its first victims among the film community, were still raw. And perhaps this didn't seem to be the smart time to be making movies that might seem critical of America and the American way of life. And of course, organized crime was based on the American way of life. It was like American big business seen in a distorting mirror. Mergers were formed, takeovers were executed, rivals were liquidated, and bosses were abruptly removed from office. The smaller studios, however, who had less to lose in political influence and position, were less sensitive. And so the films that dared to mention the Mafia, usually referred to as the mob, the syndicate, or whatever euphemism was currently popular, were the B pictures that operated on quick schedules and low budgets, and like Warner Brothers in the early days of sound, snatched their stories from the day's headlines. Phil Carlson's Phoenix City Story, for example, lifted the lid on a nightmare world of corruption and vice in a mob-controlled Alabama town. Even as the film was being made, a murder inquiry with attendant intimidation of witnesses was taking place in the town itself.
kill her just for this. They kill for less. I think very often uh, lower budget films will reflect the undercurrents of society more than an A film. It may be the lower budget filmmakers are closer to that segment of society. Maybe they have a little bit more freedom. And also not working with star names, not working with big budgets. Uh, they're a little bit looser in their approach and sometimes a little bit more honest. Hey, what's this? What? This report on the police chief, what is this? Oh, Chief Fowler. He wants me to lay off my houses for a few months. Why? He thinks someone in our camp is selling him out to Driscoll. Well, what are you paying him? 5000 a week. That's a fat bonus for a police chief. I wanted to show, very simply, how it has become such a magnificent organization, business-wise, that it's not like it was 30, 40 years ago. A fellow running a little territory, and he's got his fingers out in all little nefarious work. They have become really not just businessmen. They become executives of a category, and the category is illegal. As long as we run national projects, legitimate business operations, and pay our taxes on legitimate income, and uh, donate to charities and run church bazaars, we'll win the war. We always have. On the whole, however, it wasn't the organized city gangsters, but the more romantic, rural desperados of the 30s, the aforementioned Babyface Nelsons and Machine Gun Kellys, who appealed to the predominantly youthful B-picture audience. It was the one person, he may have had a gang, such as Machine Gun Kelly or Dillinger had a gang, but it was really the one man who was the anti-establishment, anti-hero. I think that concept has been with us for a long time, maybe it's been with us forever. And I think audience of, audiences have always identified with the one person against the establishment. Get out of the car. Open up the trunk. If there's something you're looking for, maybe I can help you find it. No, no, give him the keys. Here, open it yourself. Seems like you're pushing hard at me, mister. It makes me think you maybe got a reason. Go ahead. Search the car. Search us, too. You think those brass buttons you got give you a hunting permit on respectable citizens, don't you? You search them, push them around, eye up their women. Joe, found the Cadillac sedan about eight miles northwest of the highway. Car switch? No sign yet, but the bird scattered. This block's canceled. Okay. I'd like to take you up on your offer. I really would. Darling. You're trying to push us into a cell? Well, he was easy. Cops like to turn you sick scared just by staring at you. They start you to run in and hide, and then they laugh in their fat guts. And they beat the cement with a nightstick to make you run faster. Well, that might work with booze hounds and bums and kids stealing apples, but not with me. Not with me. Come on, let's go. The identification of the young audience with the rebels of the Depression years was to come to full prominence in the next decade with the story of a hitherto little-known pair of psychopaths who, thanks to the movies, were to achieve international notoriety 30 years after their violent deaths, Bonnie and Clyde. There's a stick-up. <coughs> yes, there's a stick-up! <laughs> right. Leave it there, leave it there.
Much to the surprise of Hollywood, Bonnie and Clyde quickly reached cult status thanks to its enthusiastic reception from the youth culture, which by the mid-60s had tuned in, turned on, dropped out, and abandoned itself to the hedonistic joys of rock music, pot, and acid. In particular, this new force in America was united in its opposition to US involvement in Vietnam, an involvement that was to have incalculable social effects for the country. In such a climate, Bonnie and Clyde was seen as a film of the rebels, for the rebels, and by the rebels. I mean, here was a revolution of middle-class kids really taking place in America at that point, you know, tripping out, staying out of the Vietnamese War. Nonetheless, there was something of a, of a certain kind of parallel that struck me as being significant. By the mid-60s in Vietnam, uh, I think there had been, was a feeling that nothing was going to change the system. And it was the first movie that made no apologies for the fact that the system was just going to have to change and go. I mean, I'm Bonnie, this is Clyde Barrow, and we rob banks. Bonnie, uh, Parker, and Clyde Barrow were perpetual adolescents. I mean, these were kids who uh, relied on each other and had no home and no place and ran and ran until they died. I'd read a piece of detail, and it was a shocking uh, butchery that took place. The moment when they finally did trap them, there were over a thousand rounds of ammunition fired at them. It was, it was just a kind of overkill <clears throat> that somehow uh, I think we all associated with, with, with Vietnamese uh, actions, with what we were doing there, this kind of massive uh, destruction. and. Uh, I, and I suppose it seemed the, the appropriate way to end this film. Hey. depicted in Bonnie and Clyde came as a shock to many people but as Howard Hawks had said earlier these were violent times and there were those especially on the political right who looked on the liberal movements of the decade the anti-war and civil rights protesters as harbingers of the imminent breakdown of law and order in particular they felt that the new liberal legislation of the period placed too much emphasis on the rights of the accused as opposed to those of the victim. Well, there was this idea that, that people were victims and that the law really wasn't protecting you anymore. That was the first time that people were really aware of the fact that criminals were being let off, that uh, uh, the law, that the, that the police, the, the system that they had depended upon, you know, that it really goes back to the idea of the Western sheriff, that Matt Dillon or whatever is going to satisfy everything. There will, you know, at the end of gun smoke, it will be settled, the killers will be shot or put in jail. And Dirty Harry said, no, this isn't necessarily true. You know, this. The criminal is getting off on technicalities all the time, and I think that's something that's been boring the public for a long time in this country, is that the, uh, that the technicalities were allowing people to go back on the street, and nine times out of ten, the, the, they'd commit another crime and, and perpetrate some act of violence against a, a citizen. But sometimes, if, if it's not happening to you, it's hard to wake up to that. I've just been looking over your arrest report. A very unusual piece of police work. Really amazing. Yeah, well, I had some luck. You're lucky I'm not indicting you for assault with intent to commit murder. What? Where the hell does it say you've got a right to kick down doors, torture suspects, deny medical attention and legal counsel? Where have you been? Does Escobedo ring a bell? Miranda? I mean, you must have heard of the Fourth Amendment. What I'm saying is that man had rights. Well, I'm all broken up about that man's rights. You should be. I've got news for you, Callahan. As soon as he's well enough to leave the hospital, he walks. What are you talking about? He's free. We created a character that was really, really heinous and then let him loose again. And uh, you had to create a character equally strong to get him. Someone figures if they were a victim of violent crime, they would like to have someone spend that kind of effort on their behalf as the hero did in that 
particular case, even though he was unsuccessful in preventing murder, he went to all <laughs> lengths to try. Uh -uh. I know what you're thinking, punk. You're thinking, did he fire six shots or only five? Now, to tell you the truth, I forgot myself and all this excitement. But being this is a 44 Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world, and will blow your head clean off, you've got to ask yourself a question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? <laughs> the violence on the streets was not the exclusive province of the psychopath. In 1971, the year Dirty Harry was released, one Joseph Colombo, creator of the Italian-American Civil Rights League and incidentally head of a New York crime family, was shot by a professional hitman right outside Paramount's head office in New York. His offence? That he brought press attention to a still shadowy organisation, the Mafia. For years, J. Edgar Hoover, the influential boss of the FBI, had vigorously denied that any such organization existed. It was rather embarrassing for him then when Joseph Fallacci, a soldier in the family of Vito Genovese, a powerful New York gang boss, broke the Mafia code of silence and testified on network TV that, oh, yes, indeed, there was a Mafia. He, he picks your finger. Who, who? The Godfather. He picks your finger. He picks your finger with a needle. Makes but a little blood come out. In other words... That's the express, the blood relation, supposedly like brothers. Uh, That's the letting of blood. That's right. In other words, uh, symbolic of the fact you're well willing to spill your blood, right. to give your blood, to give your life. Yeah. I need to go no further, just say nothing else. This is what I'm telling you, what I'm exposing to you and the press and everybody. This is my doom. The Mafia, not an organisation given over to excessive self-publicity, was not inclined to look very kindly on any such exposure of its activities. As the producers of The Godfather, the first film to offer a genuine picture of a Mafia family from the inside, were to find out. For about a week into production, a man calls, I shan't mention his name, and he said, listen to me carefully. You stop the movie, do you understand? I said, I don't understand what you're saying. Call the producer. He says, don't tell me to call the producer. When you want to cut and kill a snake, you go to the head. You cut the head off. Now, don't shoot no more. Do you know, understand me? I hung the phone up. I saw my kid in the crib. My wife. And it's only a movie. <laughs> and I so happened, I had the facility to make a phone call or two to someone I know. And within 24 hours, everything changed. Suddenly... All the locations opened, and everyone was terribly cooperative. And actually, when the film was over, they loved the picture. Now, hold it. On reflection, it's not hard to see why the Mafia themselves should have liked The Godfather. After all, it is, within the context of the film, the Mafia family who are the norm. The outside world, when glimpsed at all, being alien and suspect. Ironically, it was the Corleones who upheld traditional values, while others, apparently more honest and legitimate, rejected them. Thus, the film had a powerful appeal, not only to the Mafia, but to the more conservative and traditional sections of the audience. Well, it's an Italian family. I mean, you, you can't do a film about an Italian family without showing that is one of the last bastions of... of of, uh, of familial behavior where they do stay together, they protect one another, they have a life and they recognize that uh, there is a place for everyone within the, the, the family. I think that had an enormous appeal for a country uh, in, in which the family unit was as such was going straight to hell. I knew that Santana was going to have to go through all this. And Fredo. Oh. Fredo was. Oh. And I never. I never wanted this for you. I worked my whole life. I don't apologize to take care of my family. 
And I refuse to be a fool. Dancing on the string held by all those big shots. I don't apologize, that's my life, but I thought that... But when it was your time that... that you would be the one to hold the strings. Senator Corleone. Governor Corleone, something. I'm not a pet in Ovanda. Well, this wasn't enough time, Michael. It wasn't enough time. We'll get there, Pop. We'll get there. By this stage, of course, nobody needed any more to pussyfoot around the subject of organized crime and its links with the legitimate world. Everyone knew it existed, that it made more money than almost any other business in the USA, and that it had infiltrated a terrifyingly large range of otherwise law-abiding enterprises. But the essence of it was still crime, for after all, it was the tax-free proceeds of crime which ensured that, unlike any other business, the mob or syndicate never suffered from a cash flow problem. But crime too had changed. In the 20s, the profits came mainly from bootlegging, and the bootleggers were largely Italian and Irish, and the movies reflected that. By the 1970s and 80s, however, the big money was to be found in nose candy, cocaine, and this gave a particular opportunity to the newest immigrants, the Hispanics, who, like the Italians before them, saw crime as their shortcut to the American dream, and the movies reflected that too. In 1983, 50 years after the Howard Hawks version, the crime picture came full circle with Brian De Palma's remake of Scarface. Did I say crime and the crime movies had changed? The plot is uh, very much like the uh, original film. Well, basically, we just dealt with what it would be like to be Scarface in American society in the uh, 80s. Arrested. Nobody had ever sort of looked into the, the whole world of the Cuban cocaine traffic in South Florida, which, is, of course, been reported in the news a lot, but nobody had ever used it for a movie. And it was just unique material. This was when I was a kid, you know? Mm -hmm. You should see the other kid. Mm -hmm. You can't recognize him. And this? Well, that's no other. That's for my sweetheart. Sweetheart, my ass. We've been seeing more and more of these. Some kind of code these guys use in a can. Pitchfork means an assassin or something. You want to tell us about it, Montana? Do you want to take a little trip to the detention center? You know, if you're at the bottom of the system and you want to get rich and famous and have fast cars and big houses, you get into something illegal. The perennial appeal not only of crime but of the crime movie was proved when Brian De Palma then turned to the original source of the Scarface nickname, Al Capone, who, 40 years after his death, was still as famous as the actors who portrayed him. At the box office, at least, crime does pay. Well, I'll tell you, you know, it's touching. Like a lot of things in life, we laugh because it's funny and we laugh because it's true. Some people say, reformers here say, put that man in jail. What does he think he is doing? Well, what I hope I'm doing, and here's where your English paper's got a point, is I'm responding to the will of the people. <laughs> <laughs> people are going to drink. You know that, I know that. We all know that, and all I do is act on that. And all this talk of bootlegging. What is bootlegging? On the boat, it's bootlegging. On Lakeshore Drive, it's hospitality. <laughs> I'm a businessman. 